Hey everyone, welcome back to Style on Origins, the podcast that takes a quick peek in the past lessons that we can learn from previous evidence and experiences and history records on the practice of learning and development, uh, focusing on corporate learning and what lessons can we learn from that to apply today and make better practices for the future. Today is another great episode. Because we do have a guest, I've been lucky so far of getting amazing guests, and today's guest is no different than that. Um, actually, I have a lot of admiration for this lady. She is um, the Dean of School of Education at the University of Alaska at Anchorage, and her name is Dr. Tonia Doucet. Am I saying your last name right? You are. Awesome. So, Tonia, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, please let the audience and the listeners know a little bit about you. What is it that you're focused on uh, besides what you're doing today at work? But, you know, there's a reason why we're talking and we're talking about instructional design models and you have been really interested in that. So share your thoughts with us and welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Alex. It is a pleasure to be here. My background is pretty varied. So like a lot of folks in instructional design, I came out of the teacher education world. I came out of teacher licensure, at agricultural education, so career and technical education. I certified in, for secondary ag education in Texas. But it was right after getting my bachelor's degree that I found myself working in instructional design without knowing that that was a field or a thing. So I fell further down that rabbit hole through my master's degree and in my career after my master's degree, working as an instructional designer for the Texas A&M Engineering Extension Service. I got to work on highway traffic safety, law enforcement, anti-terrorism training. It was fascinating and really pushed me to go get my doctorate. So I got my PhD from the University of Georgia in learning design and technology, where I got to work with Rob Branch and really dive into the world of instructional design models. And that's been my happy place as a systems thinker, as someone who loves to sit back and look at the interconnections between education systems. So from there, I actually fell back into teacher ed, but I've always tried to keep a foot in that corporate technology world of what's happening. Being able to help teachers move from the classroom into instructional design, if that's their goal, or bringing what we do in corporate and industry instructional design into the PK-12 world. So that's kind of where I've been for the past 10 years or so as a faculty member in academia, but researching what, how do we get great learning environments and how do we use the natural curiosity and motivations of learners, paying attention to what are the systems and models that underlie what we do. Mm, nice. That sounds very interesting. And I, Based on what you're we're doing now, I, I have some interesting questions that um, I'm, I'm very interested in knowing things about. But obviously, we're going to stay on focus on topic <laughs> well, and talk about the uh, instructional design models because you and Dr. Branch, uh, Robert Marie Branch, have uh, done such a great contribution, I think. I mean, I ran into this... Um, probably about four or five years ago. And I think it's now up to well, the, the what, sixth edition? Sixth edition just came out in the fall. Uh, right. The survey of instructional development models was the original monologue from Dr. Gus, Kent Gustafson. He wrote this as a monologue just on a reflection of the state of the field of instructional design at the time. And then eventually invited Rob, who was a young new professor out of Syracuse who landed at the University of Georgia. He invited Rob to the project. So the two of them produced, I believe that was additions two through two and two through four. There we go. And then as a graduate student, uh, I started working with Rob on the annotated bibliography was how I got involved in the project. It took us a few years to get the project out. And at that point, Dr. Gus was retired. So he handed over the project completely and Rob asked me to step on. So we produced that fifth edition in around 2014 or so. Mm -hmm. And just produced the the latest edition, the sixth edition, and we flipped authorship. And the new one is a very complete revamp. We took away the different focus areas on what's a systems model versus a classroom model and mm -hmm. just focused on models. And Rob, and that was my piece. And then Rob really, really took a shot at that taxonomy and paying attention to the learning environment and the learners in our environment 
really taking this from that behavioral perspective of the field, shifting it to more of a cognitive exploration of how do we design learning for the 21st century? Mm, yeah, definitely. And 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 the purpose of that well, those books, what do you think it was exactly? Was it more like a guide for the educational programs or a guide for anyone learning instruction design? Or it, initially, it was just a reflection, but then it began to grow as folks reached out to Dr. Gus and let him know how useful they found it. It's been amazing to me over the years to see how it's used whether it's a graduate student and their faculty member requires the book as one of their texts in a class, or they are an instructional designer in the field and someone showed them the book because we've got the PDF of the fifth edition for free on the AACT website. Mm. Those are the ones that I love because that's where it really matters. But then the other piece I've found is handing the survey book to an administrator, whether they're in higher education or their management and a corporation. What is instructional design? This book is a great succinct overview without necessarily having to dive into the controversies or the history and just getting, okay, what is this thing that we're talking about? I keep being told that we need instructional designers on our staff. What do they do? Here, let me hand you this book. So it becomes this useful tool depending on what your perspective is. And if you're the advanced researcher, Sometimes it's great for ideas on how to rethink your variables in a study if you're studying learning context, or maybe it's a great tool for the team you're working with to reconsider how you design that outreach, that camp, that workshop, whatever it is you're putting together. Mm, but really, it is. What's your perspective? And that perspective is what helps you see the surveys book through different lenses. So I've now had folks who've had it through multiple editions or they started with the fifth edition, now they've got the sixth, and they can see themselves maturing in the field and using the book in different ways over time. Okay. All right. Interesting stuff. Very, um, very informative. Thank you so much for that. So let's dive a little bit into somewhat of history of instruction mm -hmm. design models, because uh, obviously before we started recording, we had some great conversations and you and I connected in many ways, which is great. And um, which I got to say as well, it surprised me. So awesome! <laughs> I didn't know you from before I told you, you know, it's a, yeah. I had some admiration for you because of the work that you've done with this book. And, uh, but uh, I'm really grateful that we got to meet each other this time, this time around. So <clears throat> what, what would you say was the first instructional design model? <laughs> it wasn't Addy. I can say that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ding, ding. <laughs> this one is actually a tough one. I mean, we could go, we could try to take this from a, an academic approach and say, which is the first one that we saw cited in the literature? Mm -hmm. Honestly, it would probably be something basic and simple like an Addy process. Mm -hmm. But really, I go back to the IPISD as one of the most visible first models that we saw. Wow. Yeah. Because of where it was being used. Absolutely. And uh, for those of you folks that don't know, check the links on the description of this video or if you're watching on YouTube and also because we're on YouTube and check out the LinkedIn newsletter. We also have the um, links there where you can access all the information and resources we're going to be talking about, including the um, links to the edition of the book on the surveys, the survey of instruction design uh, models or development. And so the, we're talking about the IPISD, and that's the Inner Service Procedures for Instructional Systems Design, uh, by led by um, Dr. Branson. Uh, rest in peace. He just passed away a couple of years ago, yeah. and um, I was lucky enough to interview him. So thank you to Guy Wallace connecting me to. Uh, oh, that's wonderful! I haven't heard Guy's name in forever. Oh yeah, Guy Wallace. He's all over LinkedIn. You just gotta be there and see him. Now look. <laughs> yeah, he's a good buddy of mine. He's also a Navy shipmate, right? So, um, so the, so that's great. That I and I agree with you with that because the once we get to look at the actual the work that it took and the inside knowledge of that, which was you know, uh, the only the only mistake that they make and they made or you know that I think was made in this part of the conversation that I had with uh, Dr. Branson. The only mistake was that they they listened to someone in the military propose that this was going to be a, 
a model for all services <laughs> because that means that whoever did that did not know <laughs> how the services work, right? No. <laughs> and clearly had never been involved with the DOD. Oh, we're not United Services. <laughs> no. The military. We are the military services branches. They're branches. Remember that. Yes. Branches. <laughs> so they, they never follow the same approach. Um, so in the, what, one key component of that is, that, A, it took five years of research by multiple people involved, and it had some redlining in the background by none other than... Robert Gagné. So, I mean, if you need more than that, let me know, folks, because in 1942, Robert Gagné published his first paper on task analysis. And in 1962 to 65, he worked on the conditions of learning, but he also had uh, some kind of revelation doing this work. And he said that if he was going to do instructional design, this is, I'm paraphrasing, but this is actually a quote that I posted for, that if he, now that he, based on what he had learned that if he was going to uh, do instructional design moving forward, it will be based on tasks and not on topics. Task analysis. Yeah. So task analysis. I love teaching task analysis. Exactly. Yes. So, um, so that's, that's, that's awesome. Um, I got a question for you that is a little bit off the topic, but inside, but right. based on the fact that you're right now, uh, working with teachers and whatnot, um, it's there are rumors out there and I can't confirm this, but are learning styles a requirement for a program? No, no, they are not. They're not. That is a great, okay. So where they are, are we, unfortunately where are we getting this learning styles from oh, this pervasive myth. <laughs> Bless Daniel Willingham and his work. Oh my gosh. Uh, it, it is funny depending on where you are in the country to see how pervasive this myth is. Uh -huh. When I got to Idaho from Wyoming, I was floored because it was being taught in our teacher prep courses. And I'm looking at the department chair and I was like, what? Excuse me? Now, this is my favorite part. Okay. We, we got into a disagreement because he thought that we needed to be teacher, teaching learning styles. But he thought that Gagne and objective writing weren't grounded in academia or scholarship. Oh, wow. I was like, I. I mm. Mm, yeah, I know. I know. That, that was a tough conversation that yourself. day. Yeah, hold yourself. I get it. Um, so, but yeah. it, it continues to persist. It's actually one I love to help folks with this pre-service teachers in particular. Okay. I will give them a position paper assignment, and it's always an option to debunk an educational myth. Mm. Pick something that's pop psych, and let's go after it. Nice. And I always would get at least two students who would say, "I'm a visual learner. I'm a kinesthetic learner. I'm an auditory learner." Right. Let's go write that paper. And they come back to me and they're like, what do you mean that's a myth? But mm. then by the end of the semester, they're like, I have been selling myself short. I have made myself believe in a myth. Mm -hmm. And now I'm not learning as effectively as I could. Oh, I see. So I have a, I have a great. So that, that, that was just that yeah. question. This is a, you know, it, it had to be asked. I mean, so what I can Absolutely. tell you is, Whoever wants to learn good teaching, you need to go to University of Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> Learning styles. Good. So, but then again, that might be a problem because you might not get work in any school because all schools want to talk about that. <laughs> so thankfully we're slowly putting out the folks who know. Hopefully this will resolve. Yes. All right. Back to the uh, regular program. Yes, back to yes. instructional design. Back to regular programming. Yes. Okay. So I have I have a couple of trivial or let's say not trivial, but, you know, historical based questions that perhaps um, you may have some good answers for that, or maybe something you go like, oh, really? So in the quest of things that I've been looking at, you know, I think we discussed before the episode that the origins of instructional design, at least if someone wants to look out there and find a few papers, um, there was a the couple of part papers that uh, Rob Reiser wrote on uh, part one, part two, history, instruction, design, and everything points to, I mean, there's a mention of school museums in 1903 or something like that. And uh, that, you know, the school museums were sort of the beginning of uh, the use of the, everybody always refers to the 1900s as a visual movement. And, the, the, mm -hmm. you know, but that seems to be very education based, not anything related to workplace learning, or let's say how people were doing work. We know that we have the 
in the business size and the work size and the industry, obviously the industrial revolution kicks in, right? And right. we have machinery, we got four with the line assembly, and we have also a little event that happened in 1914 to 1917. Uh, you know, just a little one, World War One, eh, smidge. But uh, what I meant by event is the actual passing of the need for the Emergency Fleet Corporation. Mm -hmm. Emergency Fleet Corporation is actually led by Charles R. Allen, who happened to be an educational, um, uh, vocational educator. educator. Mm -hmm. uh, him and another guy named Charles A. Prosser wrote an awesome book published in like, like I think it's 1900 and it's uh, uh, Vocational Education and Democracy. Yes. And that gives it you. It was the, taught in my Ag Ed program. Yes. Oh, that's amazing. That's awesome. So why do you think that people omit that work? Because there's a book that Charles R. Island wrote called <laughs> the man, the instructor, and the job. And I mean, in there, there are some golden nuggets that pretty much fed, I mean, it was based on on the Harbarshan steps and you know, yes. what, you know, you know what that is, but I don't know also why our schools are not now. Why we don't. School teachers, I don't even know what that is. Um, we have but, the attention span of a goldfish <laughs> and we have the memory of a goldfish. <laughs> is that what it is? We're always chasing the shiniest thing, or we're trying to call something that we did before something new. But this is actually something that it's an interesting phenomenon. I don't know what we can give a name to this. I pointed this out in an article that I published in Tech Trends with a colleague in the Ed Foundations field, Ed, Ed Janik. He's the department chair at the University of Toledo. Uh -huh. He was doing uh, his sabbatical research on the history of educational radio. Mm. And he reached out to me as he was going through microfiche in Oklahoma during his sabbatical and said, I'm hitting some interesting tech things. Can you meet with me? And I was a first year faculty member. Absolutely. I'd love to see what you've got. So that was one of the ways I fell down that history rabbit hole. And as we're, I'm going through this with him, I'm like, wait a minute. Educational radio was the first massive open education system we had yes i've got an idea so of course i go run to the literature oh no MOOCs just magically appeared out of nowhere in the 21st century <laughs> and the literature suddenly happens there's nothing beyond that we don't our memory doesn't associate for whatever reason ed radio with MOOC. and so we put this article together specific we have two we had one that focused on how emancipation was a outcome of educational radio in Oklahoma at the time for his research agenda. But then for mine, we put out all things considered at radio as the first MOOCs mm -hmm. and challenge that literature base because we're not looking beyond it. Initially, that article didn't pick up much traction. It's starting to get more attention now as that field matures. This is where I'm going to put out a call on my colleagues. Mm -hmm. If we don't publish in practical places or access accessible places, this call to action, this, hey, you're not looking at the history, then we will forget it. Right. And we will keep repeating new things and calling them old things or not realize that we're missing a hidden gem in history that could be guiding our current practice. Absolutely. So everybody listening, please uh, go ahead and share this episode. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I encourage all your colleagues to uh, reach out. <laughs> we can talk. But um, yeah, that's a great point. So we have th all this knowledge, by the way, then led to um, an evolution. So obviously there was no talk of the actual term instructional design. Um, but systems design was kind of a phrase at the time. And you start with that, if you consider it, I mean, if we were going to consider it from an academic perspective, we've got to look at Tyler, uh, yeah. the systemic curriculum, right? Um, with the introduction of form formative evaluations and um, and having actual system, systematic goals, or let's say evaluation uh, right. um, goals. And so, and I mean, he fed into that because he fed into then, I believe the first systemic model was like in 1960, some author mm -hmm. by the name Bar Bear or Bar, I, I will, you know, check the link, it's in there. Was that? 
I was like, I can double check too. I've got a couple of my historical. Okay, yeah, so it's like bar, bar, or bar, and something like that. I can I can't recall right now in my head, but uh, it will be in the links. And uh, and from there we start on. And obviously, you know, I think we have to put into context the events that kind of led to a lot of these things. But there was an interesting, again, another thing that uh, not many people mentioned, which is the TWI movement. So training within industry, nineteen forty, right. We're talking about four people. They call them the uh, four horsemen of the <laughs> of the movement or something. Um, I wrote a, a blog post. Check the links, guys. But um, essentially what we're talking about here, just imagine if we went into a World War III, <laughs> right? And we didn't know what to do. They pulled directors, training directors from companies, for the most successful companies. AT&T was one of them. Ford was another one. And those folks came in and then set up some kind of like train to train. That's a train yep. to trainer program, basically. And the train the trainer, that phrase, it's only used in certain parts of the country still. And they typically have a military connection or background if they use right. it. Right. I used that comment just recently at a science of reading symposium here in Alaska. And it was a trainer from Texas. And she was like, wait a minute, because we don't hear that word up here in Alaska. But if you think about what was happening in the 40s and why we needed that, between the workforce shift, the liberation movement, and the war, how many of our workforce rapidly needed to be trained up? And we knew we didn't have the capacity to do it. So we used that train the train the model that we've somehow forgotten. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I, and I mean, if you look at the IPISD, it, it basically used the train, that. train the program because it was for the military instructors in mm -hmm. school. Which brings us to another interesting conversation we'll get into about teachers, about instructors, mm -hmm. right? because um, I think it's just human nature that standardization is not a uh, not a welcome thing. <laughs> so, no. so that's why the IPISD failed, really. Uh, I mean, it, it had good success, but it failed because it provided a standard saying rigid train this way, which makes sense, right? You say, hey, ten instructors. That's how you ensure quality, right? And that way you can see if it works or it doesn't work. Oh, yeah, figures. But concept it's, versus it's, practice. But that's not how we operate. And the human factor in the middle. Yeah, exactly, human factor in the middle. So um, so we have then, you know, the evolution of things. Uh, Events-wise, I don't know if you knew this, but the TWI movement became the foundation for Lean. And I did it, not. Be it became the, uh, it became, yes. it became the foundation for the Toyota production system, which then became Lean. Uh, and actually, in actuality, it's interesting. It's a very uh, mafia-like history there. But the Tito Vlad movement, technically speaking, is supposed to be all those materials are available online free. And because of the 80-year rule, right, it's yeah. public domain. However, there is an institute called the training, the TWI, Training with the Industry Institute, and they charge $5,000 for a certification. <laughs> so <laughs> go figure it out. But anyway, uh, hey, juicy history there, folks, for you. Hey, searcharchive.org. That is where I actually find a lot of our foundational books. When I'm trying to update the ID models, books or chapters that I've done. The internet? No one has those books. But if I go to archive.org, I can yes. check them out for an hour unlimited. Yes. And I keep, and I, and they're scanned. It's the, it's a scan of the original book. Yes. And I just found that out doing this podcast, by the way. So believe incredible. It's when awesome. I find that archives that are for check the links again in the description. Um, it, it changed my life. I was like, what? Yeah. Are you serious? I can books that you can't find anywhere. They're all available there. And books unlock history and knowledge. Mm, absolutely. So, okay. Fantastic stuff. We talked about that. We unraveled that. We had a problem with literacy, which is covering the other episodes here, folks. So if you check, the first episode was in the man, in, uh, the man, the job, and the instructor on the job. Um, and um, we had um, a literacy problem. The army couldn't recruit people well, this and that. So the war is over. For adult basic education. They passed the, the Readjustment for Servicemen Act, which is basically the GI Bill. Everybody starts going to college, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, obviously, except probably women, unfortunately, because if you actually check this, most of the workers that were involved in this were women because all the men were gone. Yep. Yeah. They were all the line workers. That story there, but, um, but a story of resilience as well. So 
now is you know we we're getting to this golden era the 50s right and you start seeing this uh models come around in the 60s and obviously what would you say is the golden era instruction design where everything pretty much was set and nothing else i mean nothing really has changed that much it really hasn't i mean you and i were kind of hinting at this when we were chatting before but there's nothing novel in the last 20, 30, 40 years of instructional design models. So 1970, it, it basically we're stopping at the IPISD and then whatever else spin off of that because you don't have to say it, but I will say it and you can agree. Go ahead. agree. I think that every model after the IPISD or any notion of anything that has to do with instructional design is a spin off of the IPISD. And not exactly novel. <laughs> so I mean, when I look some at digging, some or some iteration uh, or variation. Uh, yeah, of I, yeah. I, you don't have to say because I know you are in academia, but I would like to say, and I mean, I invited Dick, Dick one of the dicks. I don't know, a uh, Dick Carry or whatever, to uh, come. <laughs> it sounds funny, but um, to come onto the podcast by mediation, and I, I don't think they ever came. It was a different podcast, but it didn't come. Um, I say that because when I look at Dick and Carries, I don't see a difference. The only difference is that we are making assessments up front or we are tying the evaluation up front. Uh, Little notion is back the, then in the 19, in 1990s, the Army and the Air, the Navy and the Air Force revised, and the Army, they revised Addy to be, um, to be not waterfall anymore. Yes. Which was and, the biggest thing. You say that because most people don't talk about Naveen or Diamond and their instructional design models, but we had them in the surveys book. And in my grad program, one of the funnest exercises I ever did was to take an actual ID project that we did and reflect on it backwards, mapping every step to a different ID model. Mm, and we actually found pieces of waterfall in what we did. Mm. One of my arguments these days is that nobody follows a single model at all. No, I don't. Yeah, it's true. And every project is going to vary in some way. It's and it was true. really that paper. I had been a professional instructional designer for more than five years at that point. And when I reflected on that one project and I realized that I think we counted and it was eight different models in this one project mm. that were represented. Mm. That told me that this is always a unique and dynamic process and we have models. Maybe someone will innovate and create something that's different. Maybe they'll convince me. I'll, I'll sit here at my table with my, my sign that says change my mind. So that takes me to an interesting conversation then. Would that imply that, because I can see the, how that then leaves openings for other stuff. Like you were saying, nobody really uses a model. And the reason being is because perhaps a no one really did Addy the right way, which is not a model, but it came it came to be it's the acronym, so it came to be the known thing. Nobody knew about the IPISD, or at least didn't, you know, not many people had any notion of the IPISD. And a few who did that it was too complex. Right. It was too complex. Um so does that mean that instructional design is dead? I don't think it does. I think it means that we've established a solid foundation that we can evolve from. So this is an interesting conversation that I'll give a shout out to Victor Lee at Stanford. He and I had this discussion years ago. He has a chapter in Rick West's open textbook on the foundations of learning instructional design and technology, where Victor talks about divergent evolution in fields and the relationship between IDT and the learning sciences. Mm, okay. So this is where you could get really controversial and we could dive into engineering design. How much do you feel that many of these names that are getting coined are more like, sometimes to me, they feel like facades. They feel like marketing terms to make a program. Very much so. To make a college or a program more relevant. Um, I have looked at a number of the, the new engineering Learner in, learning engineering programs that are out there and you look at the course list and you're like, okay, so it's mostly instructional design with a little bit of 
MIS or IT overlaid with it. Right. What about learning experience design? It's an important field, but it's really just part of what we were doing all along. Right. Or at least it, we should have been doing. When you say it's an important field, though, it's a field that has been going on for what? Only three years or four, maybe? It's maturing, but it was always a part of what we were doing. So now it feels like somebody splintered off and they want to dive deeper. Okay, okay you can. But what, what I'm finding is that it's just going to lead me back over to the psychology research on motivation right. or the sociology research on belonging. Mm. Okay. So and it's not really a new field. It's just between fields. Right. So one of I noticed something. I don't know if I'm wrong, but I may be. But. I noticed checking one of your last editions. I don't know if it was the fifth or the sixth, but you guys threw in there backwards design. And I don't think <laughs> backwards design was there before. I, at least it looked new to me. Hang on. I'll tell you exactly because in that uh, open t textbook from Rick West, I've got a chapter on instructional design models. And I have a table in there <laughs> of every edition of the book and what models we covered when. Oh, nice. That's awesome. And so, yeah, the reason uh, and, and the reason why I'm asking about this uh, while you're looking for it is that mm -hmm. backwards design, you know, as we look at it, was created by educators for educators or let's say teachers for teachers. But it has gained a ton of popularity in the corporate side, in the corporate learning side. And I think, you know, suspicions of that will be because we have a lot of teachers joining in instruction design and also because we have. Uh, as you said, a lot of people that don't use uh, actual models. And so we're looking for the, it was e the fifth part. edition and it had never been in the book before. And it was me who wanted it added is the fifth edition. Okay. And why? Because backwards. So one of the, you, you asked me this at the beginning of the, the episode, uh -huh. what was the purpose of the book? One of the purposes that Dr. Gus talked about was trying to capture the state of the field at any one moment and what models were being used. Okay. And that was why you saw UBD come in and you saw Agile pop in for the first time mm -hmm. because industry and software were heavy on Agile and K-12 was heavy on UBD and I wanted them in front of the field. Makes sense. Makes sense. And also it helps. Yeah, it helps. It, it, it displays that the book is also uh, relevant or actual, I guess. Yes. Happening. That's great. Yes. And so what's your take on UBD? Because to me, UBD solved the problem that was localized in school curriculum. I'm a big fan of it in general, because oftentimes I think about this from a military mindset. You don't always know what process you need to take. You only have your end outcome. That's the only thing that was given to you for your mission. Okay. And if you're going to build something off of your end outcome, UBD is the model that's going to help do it. Okay. But so would you consider it to be more of a content development model? Yes. It's less of a learning experience or learning environment, more of a content. Right. So what I would say is that UBD would be great if you already had done an analysis or if you needed to do an analysis. Yes. If you've done an analysis because you don't have the time to do one. Okay. Cause that's the, that's the one. It does take part. a lot of assumptions and skips. That's where I, that's where I got stuck with it. And I kept telling people, and I mean, I'm not popular for that because I, <laughs> I, I, bought, which I is also why it doesn't work great in industry and isn't always the best in K-12. It's fine if you can make assumptions. So the example here, when I went to do my dissertation, I was experienced with emergency responders and adult learners. Okay. So when it was time to pick my dissertation research topic, yes, I wanted more experience researching with minors and looking at different ed tech, but I could save myself time and IRB headache if I worked with adult learners and emergency responders. Mm. So I worked with paramedics and I redesigned their continuing education to look at multimedia design principles. Okay, good. I couldn't have done an early child. I could actually use a little bit of UBD in that design. I couldn't have done that in an early childhood or an elementary setting because I'd have to know who those learners were. Okay. So UBD really is more about, it's like, you know, we need a cake and you're like, okay, well, uh, let's see to make a cake. Here's the steps to go through to make a cake. Right. Because I, I look at, I, I look at you when you look at it and a lot of people make this, the they always make this distinction. It's like, oh, that is too complicated. First of all, okay, we know the discussion that it's not a model. Great. 
But even if you look at the process, oh, I is too complicated and uh, the backwards design is better. And I say, well, backwards design is better because you begin with the end in mind. So somebody, this guy's, I realized that people are saying that because this guy's borrowed the quote from Franklin Covey and threw it in the book. Jeez. I don't know if you knew that. Do you know that? I did not. Right. So chapter one of UBD hits you with begin with the end in mind and Franklin right. Covey as a quote. Because I, with I, the I end knew in about mind. Franklin Covey and I knew about that quote. You know, and I'm going like, okay, that's that sounds like Franklin Covey. Where is this coming from? So that guy that got me co conscious or let's say curious about saying, okay, hmm, so what came first? <laughs> you know, is, that, is Franklin Covey talking about this stuff or? So it wasn't related, but they used the quote um, to kind of, you know, give some kind of metaphor uh, or support to the model. So I you remember when his book came out. Yeah, I know. That's the thing. So isn't it was like 89, 90. So it's, it was in between. Uh, and you know what it is? Um, begin with the end in mind is out of the seven. Uh, it's seven uh, habits of highly effective people. Exactly. And seven Here habits. I found the first edition. 88 or 87 or something like that, I think. Um, so, that is so anyway, so we had that there. And, um, and that's what I was picking out on backwards design and saying like, okay, you know, if you're making content, great. But with those three stages, how can you say that you are actually solving a business problem, helping solve a business right. problem that is task based because you're not really doing an analysis up front with it that is, that is substantial. But it's perfect for a K-12 task based focus. Right, exactly. Well, okay, so there we are. So we got FBSD, we have uh, backwards design. And as you mentioned, a lot of people, how did, how did Agile make it into any this conversations because agile can be so many things. I'm a scrum master and people are like also caught up in this. So I think businesses were pushing for this, right? Businesses were huge. I know that when we were working on the annotated bibliography, that would have been around 2011, 2012. Mm. And every, every software company was pushing agile. Everybody was tweeting about their Monday scrum. Mm. And it was, it didn't matter what you were in. If you were in banking and tech, if you were in any kind of software, you were using Agile for your production and your development. Oh, wow. Wow. So how many instruction design models are there? Dozens and dozens. So uh, when I double checked... I think in your books, you got like about 15 that were covered from there. In the fifth edition, we covered 21 different models, and that was the largest. Mm. And we didn't even cover all of them because when I was writing the book chapter that we'll give folks the link to, mm -hmm. I asked people in the field for different models that they liked or that they would recommend. And it was actually one of my colleagues from the Netherlands who gave us Plomp's OKT model to mention. And right. I don't think we ever covered Plomp in the surveys book. And it's not one that's been used heavily in the U.S., but it is used heavily in the U.K. and throughout Europe. Mm, yeah. And one last question that I have for you then related to uh, um, related to instructional design models is... Um, I noticed that basically the weaknesses of every team, or I can tell where the weaknesses are for any team that is in business. Um, it's if we're going to put it in terms of Addy is the A and the E and uh, most people are doing the DI. Um, yes, get the analysis and the evaluation, which are absolute failures in judgment. Right. Failures in judgment. Uh, usually it's because it's not known. Usually it's because a bunch of not known, don't have the time, don't have the money. We can go back to the project management. Right. Don't have the business support, blah, blah, blah. The same, same questions, same issues. And I think it's just a matter of behaviorism as well. If you're going to get your paycheck anywhere, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, Which is but, annoying. And that was something I fought against constantly. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Absolutely. I, and as I, when I was a consultant, same thing. And when I worked in every job, it's the same thing. You know, I, I worked in four different in industries and that never changed. Um, the only way I could get an organization to change their tune was if we weren't talking about compliance, although that would tend to help because then you've got legal ramifications. Right. But if we're talking about a return on investment. And if you are a training producer, 
you care about evaluation because you want to make sure you're bringing your learners back to buy the next course that you're producing. Right, 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 right. correct, correct. So in terms of evaluation, um, this is one question that was kind of curious and related, but not on it. When, when you look at evaluation, a lot of people, you know, the IPISD basically promotes two things, evaluation at evaluation of the learning um, function itself, right? Or the learning activities and their, and their right. outcomes. And also evaluation of the process itself, the actual yes. design process. And that usually doesn't happen. I, don't, I haven't you seen that. that. I haven't seen a after action report of, hey. Oh, AARs. I haven't heard that phrase in forever. Yes, we skipped the AAR piece. This is actually coming out in the, if we take it slightly from the, the industry world into academia quickly, design-based research, which is a great intersection of instructional design because you're designing a learning solution and extending theory at the same time. I've got a piece that is in final review now. It's actually with Jill Stefaniak at Georgia and Lauren Bagdy at Georgia and Tulane Asino at Oklahoma State where we're arguing that ethnographic reflection piece mm -hmm. in design-based research, it's the same concept as an AAR from military training and that after action review of, it's not okay just to know if the materials worked, mm. did our design process work, did our sequence work, did our roles work? How could it be improved and whatnot? And why do you think the evaluation of instructional design is so limited in terms of, let's say, known approaches. I mean, a lot of people keep throwing around Kirkpatrick's for the last 70 years. I'm so glad you said it and not me. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't think I have anything to lose. Maybe <laughs> I can be surprised. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, uh, you know, Kirkpatrick's, everybody just you know, regurgitates Kirkpatrick's four levels, five levels, whatever. Yeah. And, um, and then I don't know if you heard lately, but there was an LTEM, the learning transfer evaluation model uh that one. Hallheimer, uh, okay. but the thing is this is made up is it's not based on research uh it's not from academia it's is people they know they say they know about learning and they're experts in learning but so far there's only been one dissertation out there that kind of mentioned it so i guess we'll see the trickle right. that is yet you know what it did is added i don't know another seven levels or another four levels i'm saying how many levels do you need because i mean <laughs> nobody nobody went past level two in Kirkpatrick so right I, what we need is someone to do a good Delphi study on evaluation ah, and processes yes. Yes. to come to that consensus that expert consensus on what is working because we're not gonna it's not that it has to come from academia if if theory isn't related to practice mm -hmm. then that theory isn't necessarily helping us as a society and if a practice isn't grounded in a theory then are we doing damage to ourselves unknowingly? Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, and that's where I would love to see evaluation move forward as a field. Unfortunately, we saw this downturn in the whole adult education side. We watched as academic programs were either stripped or withered away on the vine. Mm -hmm. Here at UAA, I walked into a treasure gift that I didn't even realize until after I accepted the job. One of my emerita faculty owns the resort on Yukon Island off the coast of Homer that oh. adult educators have been doing annual retreats at for more than 40 years. Oh, wow. She has an interview with Malcolm Knowles. Oh, okay. She has interviews with all of the foundational adult education researchers and practitioners there's a resource room in our UAA consortium library that she told me about. And I walked in and I was like, oh, my gosh, I went straight to the bookshelf and I was pulling off all of the books that I had read as a master's and a doc student. And I'm staring at this gift going, how do we preserve this and how do we revive this before it's gone? Mm. Well, I have an interview with um, something real weird that happened to me. Amazing. One of the best moments of my life. I have an interview with David Merrill <gasps> at his retreat uh, vacation home in uh, Bear Lake. So, yeah, uh, I'll send you the link. I, I, I Part of it, I, I published it on ATD, on the ATD when I was president of ATD. But, yeah, that was... Uh, 
I want you to imagine him wearing a suit at a reception, a university reception and a University of Georgia ball cap backwards. <laughs> yeah. I have a photo of this and it is one of my favorite he's pictures he's, as a grad student. Amazing. Yeah, he's amazing. He's amazing. He, you know, I he also told him, me I was right in a publication. Oh, I, I can't do any better than that. No, of course not. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And I think you can still see him. And I think he still goes to ACT. Right? Occasionally he comes and he'll produce workshops for us. And he's still updating the Pebble in the Pond book. The second edition came out. Oh, okay. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, I know. I've seen him being active uh, in a couple yeah. of years and things. Well, um, you know, I got to say, uh, <laughs> Tanya, really uh, happy to have uh, been able to have this conversation with you. I feel that you and I can talk for 20 more hours. and Easily. Just- uh, back and forth, toe to toe in different ways. And, yep. uh, I'm just happy that, you know, there's people like you in the world. Uh, first of all, they are academics and they, they give me hope in a lot of things because I always hear uh, so many people are, they are really close loop and not really helping have a vision beyond what uh, is being sort of passed along. Last questions before you go is quick rounds of things and you know because i've seen this come and go and 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 influence uh places uh influence the practice in in business so um design thinking what do you think of this what what is is it addy with a with a better flavor with a humanistic flavor that has a i mean to me it seems like a very something you can't really dispute i would say that like human center design right you can't right. how do you fight that you can you know it's better than saying Oh, instructional systems design, because that sounds very nerdy and IT based or engineering right. based. So what do you feel? Of, how, how's your feeling on this whole design thinking or for this type of purpose? I'm a fan of design thinking. I don't necessarily see it as a great instructional design approach. And I say this having taught it as a first year seminar at Wyoming. Oh, wow. It was a course that I designed called Creating in a Modern World. Mm. And I had first year students at Wyoming get into small teams, had a whole different approach to make that happen and make everybody happy. But they had to investigate a problem. So it was a problems based approach. And they had to find out what has already been designed to solve it and come up with an idea. They basically had to work through the whole process from prototype to presentation. And I had a few students who later went on to go into the entrepreneurial competition that they host there at, at UW. But we had things like the the precursor, things that didn't come to life, but thinking about problems. And that's why I don't see this as an instructional design model, but it is a societal design tool. Mm-hmm. Product, so, I mean, product or service, right? I mean, product, and that's how I, and even process, because I showed the students videos every week, started off with a different TED talk. But I showed them a video where a hospital system conducted a needs analysis, shocking, mm. and revamped all of their processes using a design systems or a design thinking approach. And so helping them think of processes, processes, or processes, products, and models that way. The students were creating ideas from actual products to how could they redesign the university learning experience. Mm. That one died on the vine because they realized we needed more than a semester to work out their concepts. <laughs> but I love it when the students get me thinking. And so I love design as a framework, but not necessarily in an ID situation. Okay. And do you ever notice that there are some parallels between the 12 multimedia principles of design by Mayer and UX visual design? Yes. And pointing out to folks that Mayor came first a long time has been fun. You think so? I think so. So the the Gestalt principles, I haven't dated them, but so I those. it's based on Gestalt, but not completely. Oh, okay, okay. And that's where uh, Ruth Clark and Richard Mayer did more extensive work on those design principles. Right in that book, yeah, they did publish a book. Yeah. And a lot of people don't pay attention to Ruth Clark's side of that work. Oh, of course not. Yeah. And she's, she's, she's been sort of the, uh, translator. The silence. Uh, yeah. The, the translator, they're getting all this academics to uh, put something that people will actually look at. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I mean, her book is, is, is also a great book. Well, 
Uh, once again, Tanya, thank you so much. I'm really, really grateful that you did this interview. I've been looking forward for a long time. And uh, well, I can, uh, you know, I'm definitely be sending some invites so we can chat more about all the topics, you know, get things going. And I don't know, maybe I'll visit you one time. Uh, you're out there in awesome Alaska. So come see me. We're, we're on the eve of the midnight sun. Oh, that's beautiful. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. And thanks, uh, Alex. We'll, uh, We'll let everybody know how to find you and all the good links.